Hello and welcome to another episode of My Property World. I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Ribbons. Great to have you back on, Paul. How you doing, Will? Thank you very much for inviting me again. So Paul is a, a legendary property trader. Uh, he's been in the property game for uh, for decades. Uh, the number of deals he's been involved with, which uh, have been completed, um, must be getting up into uh, close to a thousand at this stage. Is that, that right, Paul? It certainly is, yeah. yeah certainly been involved in a lot of deals, yeah. A lot of deals. And and we've we've had Paul on the show a a number of times with uh, episodes about uh, trading, um, about uh, his own background. He's got a fantastic backstory. Um, but we're doing a series at the moment on, uh, I, I suppose, mental skills and mental health, uh, called the Resilience Series. And the resilient series uh, today is going to be focusing on the topic of, of worry and um, how to turn worry into an opportunity. So, uh, Paul, without too much further ado, and, and I, I, I did say um, people um, should know how to get hold of you. How, how should they get hold of you before we get going? Um, uh, they can connect with me uh, on Facebook, Paul Ribbons, or they can email me paul at paulribbons.com if they wish to. Uh, I've also got a YouTube channel, um, um, Paul Ribbons. Uh, if you search YouTube, you'll find me and you can subscribe there if need be because we'll be doing a lot of content in the future. And I also put these podcasts up on YouTube as well. So if people want to see the the visual, they can do. The, the video version. Um, is, a, yeah. Absolutely. You might be watching one now. So... Um, it's great to have you on, Paul. So worry, turning it into an opportunity. How how does that work? Like, What is worry, firstly, is probably a, a good starting point. We, we were talking around this before we, we started recording, uh, and I hope you had some interesting points. Yeah, certainly. It's funny because we were talking off camera and he was asking me what, what you know, how do you stop worrying and what it's about? And 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 you mentioned a few things that, you know, that... that yeah, you worried about, but I see worry very similar to to pain. And if you think about pain, if you was to stumble over and break your leg, what would happen? Uh, you know, immediately you'd have this raging pain in your in your leg. Your your, your body would start releasing chemicals like adrenaline and painkillers to to try and um, uh, ease the pain, so you can uh, get where you need to go to to uh, to try and rest somewhere and and, uh, and and what is that what is pain what is you know what, if you think about it logically what is it and and it's a message coming from the broken part of your your, your leg or wherever you're hurting it's a message to your brain to say keep off because we we think of doctors and hospitals that we go there and we get mended by the doctors or the hospitals, but actually your body is a fantastic bit of kit, and it then goes into a repair mode. So once your the hospitals set your leg, it's not the doctors that repair your leg; it's your own body repairing. So when does the pain subside? Well, the pain subsides when the, the wound is healed. So all of a sudden, you're walking around, you don't even think about the pain anymore. Your leg's healed and, and you're running around like normal. And pain, uh, pain is, uh, worry is very similar to pain. It's just a message. Now, what I hear many, many times is, you know, I'm worried about you know, the, the economy. I'm worried about you know, my kids. I'm worried about you know, my finances. I'm, there's all sorts of things that people worry about and we'll be touching on them as we go along. But if we think about it, from another perspective if you if you think of all the things you've ever worried about 95 percent of them have never happened never you've worried about this that and the other and you, and you blow you blow it out of all proportion in your mind about worrying about your kids when they're out enjoying themselves or you know it, it might be a deal that you're doing and and this is the thing how many times has something happened? You never, never worried about it. Something big happened in your life. But what happened? You just got on with it, didn't you? You think about it, you just got on with it. You, this is what we do. We, 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 we are presented with a problem. We just then find a solution and move on. Some of us are better at solution um, uh, than, than, than others. But it, 
it's something we just have to deal with. It's presented to us. We've got no choice. It's there in front of us. What do we do? Okay, fair enough. We'll just get on with it. We'll do this, 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 this. And you might ask yourself a, a, a series of questions. So when we know what worry is, it's just a message to the brain. I need to pay attention to this, right? Now, whether that may be, let's this, let's this take, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm a bit worried about um, having a car crash. I mean, some people worry about crashing their cars. Why would you worry about it? Yeah, you've got a... Re- You've got a, a reason to be worried. There's a lot of lunatics out there. But actually, the amount of journeys that are traveled and the amount of accidents that happen is actually the, the percentage is very, 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 very low. Very low. And if you think. And, about- and I imagine that those accidents uh, that, that someone actually is, is seriously hurt is pretty low uh, again. Yeah, it's percentage wise, yeah. But actually, percentage of accidents and serious uh, um, uh, injuries. Versus total is, car yeah. genius. Because you can have a ding in your car and, and not have a, a serious accident, but you still have an accident. Although some people worry about that a lot. They do, they do, they do. And this is the thing, right? You're traveling down a road. And I, I want people to understand this. <laughs> You're traveling down a road and there's a broken white line between this side of the road and that side of the road. And there's someone driving the other side, the other direction on the other side of the road, keeping that their side of that white line. You don't even know them, but you've got complete trust in them that they're not going to come over to your side and smash into your car but you'll be driving along without even think, consciously thinking about that driver is going to stay that side of the road. Complete trust in them. You and obviously think, haven't been driving in Fiji. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but they, but we're, we're, we're talking about, we don't realise how, they're, they're, how many journeys do we make each week? How many people do we pass? How many people are on the road? Yes, we see one, we might shout at them, someone cuts us up or whatever, but... 95% of the people on the road are behaving themselves and, and actually being very respectful. And we worry about this and we got, and, and, and yes, there are things to be concerned about, but as long as you're doing the right thing, you're prepared yourself. And you, I, I used to ride a motorbike and my, my, um, my girlfriend at the time used to worry, worry, worry about me riding the motorbike. And, and I used to say to her, look, you haven't got to worry about me. I've just got to worry about the other lunatics on the road. So all I've got to do is treat everyone like a lunatic, expect them to pull out on me. So therefore, I'll anticipate just in case they do. So that was my preparation for not worrying about getting knocked off my bike. Same with my push bike. I ride my push bike. My worry, wife worries about me riding my push bike. And I say, look, I've just got to be careful and treat everyone, you know, one, with respect and consideration, but also to expect the worst. And then if I expect the worst and, the, and nothing happens, then I've had a result. I don't worry about it. I just make sure that I'm anticipating coming up to a junction. Will they pull out? I'm anticipating a car behind me on a, on a, uh, a country lane. I'm going to pull over, let him go past because he, he might try and overtake or they might have tried to overtake me a, a, a risky bend or something of that, like that nature. So it's, it's, understanding that you've got a certain amount of control over things. And as long as you're making the sensible decisions, then you've got absolutely nothing to worry about. Makes sense. It, it does. And the different types of worries that, uh, that you've mentioned a few of them. Um, so uh, around money, uh, around fear of failure, around uh, what's going on in the economy, what, what's happening to the value of of property uh, that I, I may have brought, or that the cost of financing property I haven't brought yet is a is a very common one. Um, mm-hmm. And what what people uh, might think of me uh, is another right. common one. There's a few there. You're thrown at me there all at once. Um, yeah. let, let's let's deal with a few of them at the front end. Then so the, the them front ends were were people worried about money or the economy generally, but. And that reminds me of a friend of mine who, who was really concerned, right? He opened his estate agents in 2008, right? You remember 2008? It was a terrible time. And within that, uh, over the course of the next 12 months, he used to ring me up regularly going, I, 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 I'm really worried. I said, what are you worried about? 
He said, I'm really worried. I'm going to run out of money. I said, have you got any money in the bank right now? He's going, yeah, yeah, I've got money. I'm worried about it. I'm going to run out. I said, okay, so what can you do about it? He said, well, I can't do anything. If we can't sell houses, we can't do it. I said, what's another way? He, it was, his estate agent was fairly new and he was, he was a sales agent. And I said, what other areas can you go into that you could overcome? What other this? services? Yeah. Yeah, other services. So he said to me, well, nothing. Because oh, mortgages are linked up with house sales and solicitors' recommendations are linked up. Mm-hmm. What else can you do, Mark? What else? Mm-hmm. And he sat there thinking, and he went, I suppose I could let a few. I said, if people aren't selling, <laughs> what are they going to do? They might let. And there was a lot of yeah. accidental landlords created during that time. And guess mm-hmm. what he did? He survived it's- it. And guess what he did? He never ran out of money, right? He never ran out of money. He got <laughs> close a couple of times, right? Really close. <laughs> but I said, you worry about this. But don't worry about it until it actually happens. And when it actually happens, then you can deal with it, right? So, yeah, but if I, if I worry, it's okay, what can you do about it? And that's the key to worry, right? So we think what, what, about worry and we think about, so what can I do about worrying? So with Mark, you know, what, what what's the worry, the concern? I'm going to worry, run out of money. Okay, so therefore, what can you do about it? What other things can you consider, which he did? He went into lettings. And then as long as he's doing everything he possibly can, and if necessary, put things into place, because just as I mentioned earlier, worry is like, a message to the brain. It's like uh, pain. It's telling you, I need to be concerned about. It. I need to be aware of what's going on. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a coping mes- mechanism. It's a, um, uh, you know, it, going back to. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a sports psychology analogy uh, around appropriate focus, where you can focus internally, mm-hmm. uh, like so inside your body, how you're feeling. Uh, or outside, like what, what's going on outside. Mm. And um, you can have a narrow focus or a broad focus, and that can be a, uh, mm. the, the same both internally or externally. Mm. And what the appropriate focus at a, a given time is. And the, mm. their example would be, while the ball's flying through the air towards you, thinking mm. I've got a sore foot is not really a good appropriate yeah. focus. <laughs> uh, you, you're better off waiting until play stops to notice that you're, uh, you have a sore foot. Yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. You know, you've got, your, your focus is going to be very specific. And that's, and that's asking yourself the right questions is what can I do about this? What, what do I need to be doing about it? Also, there's a, there's a little trick I can give people. Right? So, uh, there's, so if someone's particularly worried, so there's, that's an emotional response, right? And your, um, your physiology can make a big difference to the outcome of, of, you worry what, what do you mean physiology paul physiology so the way you use your body okay so so if i said to you if, if you looked at a depressed man before you even looked at him what do you think he would be doing he'd be slumped over head down there you, go. Um, right, right. you know his head would be in his hands he'd be scratching that's uh, it. Sc- scratching a, a hole in the uh, you know his scalp basically that's it so if you if i ask you to uh, be i know door number two is there's going to be someone worrying what they going to be doing so, sorry you, you cut out there be, behind door number two mm-hmm. someone who's going to be worrying what do you think they're going to be looking like uh, they're they're going to be fretful. They're, fretful, they're going to be yeah. head, heads going to be shaking back and forth, fidgety. You know, yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. So that's physiology. Is oh, you know, high up and oh. So mm-hmm. if we understand that it's a physical uh, um, uh, response, then we ask ourselves, okay, so where in my body am I feeling this worry? And, uh, and and most people will probably go here or here or, or around their abdomen somewhere. And I ask them the question, so, so does it move? Does it move? Well, yeah, it might be going up or it might be going to, wherever it's moving. And I ask mm-hmm. them to spin it round, right? To spin it round, to spin it round, to spin it round, get it faster, 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 and pull it outside of their body and then flick it round the other way, spin it round the other way, and then put it back in your body. And then that feeling goes away. It's a really mm-hmm. simple technique. Or there's another technique you can use. You can use what I call, it's not what I call, it's the guy who told me, it's called one point, which is put all your energy into your core. Mm-hmm. And then think about your work. And what do you mean put your energy in, into your core? What, well, just what, all what your, you, you know, do? imagine just, 
holding your 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 core your core is you know in your in your abdomen right mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and concentrate all your energy you know, as if your all your energy is going into that place mm -hmm. so that's where all your breath your focus your your oh, muscle tension everything. everything is going everything in there. focus on that core mm -hmm. breathe deeply and then, Some of us have bigger cores than others. Yes, um, yeah. I'm sure you do. I'm sure we do. <laughs> so once you once you concentrate on your core, or you've got rid of that, or you've changed that 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 feeling, then you can look at that problem in a different way. And and um, I like to. This is really important. The power of language. So you'll hear me use words like issue or challenge, not problem or um, like nightmares. Uh, you know, the, the language that people use. So if I, if I had, if I had a, a, something I was worrying about and it's a problem, right? Or it's a fucking nightmare. If you change the word that you use for that, issue and call it issue or something with less emotional charge then the feelings dissipate because i'll give an example of what i mean what's the word that you would use when you get angry and you get really wound up what's the word you use i mean it might you might it's a swear word but what's the word what's the place you go you, you, you'll go i'm off for What's the word you use? Uh, like for fuck's sake would yeah, probably be the. It's not. It's, it's, it's not yeah, a, yeah. A, a, yeah. a single word, but but yes, for fuck's sake. Oh, you're there, right? Yeah. It, so so would you excuse be, the language to the the listeners? Where yeah yeah. But so so that give me a a, a, a term. So are, are you fucked off, or is it, are you pissed off, or what, what would be the? I don't know for fuck's sake, but what what would be the actual? The, the feeling, um, yeah. maybe seething. Seething, right? Yeah. Change the word to I'm peed off. <laughs> and look what I'm laughing already. On. I'm laughing already. Yeah, just, 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 like that. just like that. Just change your word and you change how you're feeling. Yeah? Exactly. You it's, change it's, your focus, you change how you're feeling. So Brilliant. it's changed the language that you use because you what, mm. what happens is when you get, um, when you're seething, when you say for for fuck's sake you've stored all them times when you've been seething in the same place but you've that got word. a reference and point that for word, being it, it, it consumes you just yeah. literally even thinking about the word uh, changes my physiology yeah so because there, you've got no <laughs> reference point for peed off right mm -hmm. so you haven't got this big amount of experiences that you've put in the same place and you go mm -hmm. to that place every time you get seeding right mm -hmm. Peter, oh um, um. <laughs> so you start <laughs> laughing so changing the language it uses is so powerful when it comes to worry mm -hmm. so instead of worrying about so i've got I, i'm worried about it so okay so i'm concerned about it mm -hmm. now i want you to say i'm worried about something or i'm concerned about it say that now to yourself and see how different it feels I'm really worried about X. Yeah, I, I can feel that, uh, yeah. like, uh, actually in my skull. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, now, I'm re now I'm really concerned about this. It, it feels quite calm, actually. It's calming, yeah. It's so it's it's rash that. Rational, logical. Rational. Yeah. Well, it, it's uh, funny it's, because... It's, it's taking the emotion out of it, basically. It's two things that I'm, I'm very, very... Um, it, 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 it stood me in good stead for, for all my life. And I've I installed it into my kids. And I'm very rational and very logical on any issues that I have in front of me. Because if you come from a place of high emotion or you know emotionally charged language, it's very difficult to deal with things. It's a lot more difficult. So if you take the charge out of it, the emotional charge out of it, so as soon as you've got a concern, so you've got a concern about your daughter going to wherever or wherever the case may be, it's a completely different 
scenario and then you can think about it logically and you can deal with it rationally and then you realize actually i'm being irrational about this because i'm emotionally charged so that's a, a good way of dealing with it is using the different types of language and it's catching yourself doing it right and, and, and so you, you, yourself... you identify that you're you've got this worry you've got this concern and it might be about what's going on in the wider market what does this mean for my retirement what does this mean for my plan that was uh it was so great 12 months ago and it's not so great now yeah. uh, uh, what what's the the process one then then applies like since you've given us a couple of little tools in terms of uh, put, putting the, the the focus on your core and then secondly you know examining the language and changing the language but what what would be some of the other tools or processes that you would apply. So, so once you've changed the lag, so you've got, I've got this massive problem with me, 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 my pension pot or the reinvestments, and they're all going to go tits up and I'm worried about it. And so you've changed the language. Actually, I'm a little bit concerned about the market and how it's going to affect my retirement. Okay. So now we've got a different language, right? So now we're looking at it from a slightly different perspective. So, okay. So what can I do about it? Actually, nothing. This, right this minute, there's nothing you can do about it. But what can I do to avert a potential issue? Is the market going to crash? Is it? So we look at market indicators. We look at the wider picture and also the broader market. So when I talk about the broader market, if I go back to when I first started in property in 1986, I remember predicting house prices would be in their hundreds of thousands, not their tens of thousands. And everyone thought I was bonkers at the time because it was the 1980s. You could buy a house for 40, 50 grand, right? But I could see what was going to go on. And you could see that every so often house prices would double regardless of inflation and stuff like that, because, you know, just things expand, the, the, the economy. And during that period from, from 1986 to 2003, I've seen some really horrendous things and some really good things. But overall, over that 30 odd year period, mostly the market's been up, mostly. It dips, there can be bigger dips than others. So we do know, if you're gonna retire, how old are you now? 49. So when are you gonna retire? Uh, no plans to retire at, at all. When, well, when, I, I, I can't, retire. when I can't work, I, I'm enjoying okay, what I'm let's, doing. Let's, let's assume that you're going to dip into your pension pot by the time you get to 70, right? Sure. So you've got 21 years. I can guarantee you there'll be two recessions in that time. Guarantee it. Mm -hmm. You're going to have two dips, but you're going to have a lot more ups and dips. Mm -hmm. So if we know that, so what do I need to do with my portfolio? What do I need to do by investments? What do I need to do in order to avert a big crash? Well, you could do one of two things. I've seen this happen with many people. They, 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 they sell the high and buy the dip. So you can offload some of them now and then wait for them to come down. That's a risky strategy unless you really know what you're doing because I don't think we're going to see that much of a massive dip in the immediate future. And that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a podcast for another time, right? So if we start looking at it, that we know these things are going to happen, we know there's, that the whole market is cyclical, it's, it's a cycle, right? So we do know that. And we only have to look back at history to see that is the case. So in 21 years, as long as you've bought something sensible and you've protected yourself from any uh, real shock. So I was talking to someone yesterday, used to put all her mortgages on 10 years and everyone thought they were, she was bananas. Well, she's really proved herself now because <laughs> she's got fixed rate 10 year mortgages at 3.8%. And now... Um, people who are remortgaging now. I'm you're, you're getting arrangement fees of 3.8%. <laughs> <laughs> but she's quite, sitting pretty quite, much. But... She, she knows, and she said, I know what my payments are going to be for 10 years. They're not going to change in that 10 years. So mm -hmm. it's about forward planning. If anyone is sitting there thinking, well, you know, I'm having a shock to the system, they didn't prepare in the first place because if you took a mortgage out two years ago with the rate at to 1.9 percent anyone with the brain would have known that interest rates were going to go up right we knew that we, everyone knew that so we should have prepared for it does that make sense 
if you haven't and you're sitting there thinking, oh shit, what do I do now? Then you need to adjust and, and see which ones are working, which ones aren't working, because some of your portfolio is going to be potentially negative or, 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 or looking not as good as it did before. Well, there's other opportunities that you can do. You can perhaps sell that one that's not so good and then buy something that's better or change as different strategies. So it's understanding what I just said to Mark when he turned around and said, I'm going to run out of money. You know, start looking at what you can do about it. Because once you take that emotional charge out, you've changed your language, you're seeing it from a different perspective. Uh, we know it's a, a, a message that we need to pay attention to. What can I do about it? I've made some decisions. Now I go and implement them decisions. And then you should be able to then relax. If you're still getting worry, it could be something deeper than that. And you need to ask yourself the question, okay, so what is what haven't I thought about? Because if you have taken that emotional charge out, you've you've changed the language, you've seen it from, you know, for what it is. Because that's another thing as well is acceptance, right? Sometimes if something does is 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 occurring and it's bringing that worry closer to you because you're seeing it happening in front of you and going, well, it's actually going to affect me and it's coming closer and closer and closer. It's uh, it, it's it's make accepting that this is going to happen I, I okay i know interest rates are going to rise i know we're going to have to pay more money we're going to have we've got one of our fixed rates coming off in the next six months and it's going to be substantially higher than it was before but if i'd have said to you will in september last year in fact i might have said it to you i certainly said it to john cox uh, you saw interest rates literally all get pulled off the market. Do you remember that month mm -hmm. when all the lenders yeah. pulled their rates? And they went from... Forget about interest rates. That, that there was no lending. No. They, <laughs> well, they, they just pulled all their rates and then put new rates back up again, which was like 6%, 6.5%. And everyone's going, who are you? And I said to John, don't worry, by February, they'll be down to a sensible level. Because all they did was panic. Which was, we don't know where the base rate's going to go. So they've made a decision. We don't want to lend the money at a loss. So you might as well pull all our rates back up. And their strategy was quite straightforward. Bungalow the rates up so we got products to sell and then adjust them later when we know what the interest rate's going to do. So now we're, so, uh, we're, we're, at, the, we're at the peak of inflation. We've already gone through peak inflation. It's coming down now. We know the interest rates have, have stabilized. And now we can start planning a bit more... Um, with a bit more certainty than we did back in September. So just, just going back to this point of what can I do about it? So you, you've identified um, what, what you think is the, the root cause of your worry, what, what's causing your concern, uh, mm -hmm. just to use your, yeah. your change of language. <laughs> uh, what, what's a good methodology for selecting what you can do about it? Because Research. That, Research. Yeah. That these Research. days there's, there's so many you know conflicting bits of advice and different strategies and there's always been different strategies and always different bits of advice but something you were talking about before the show is uh, how the world's changed um, uh, substantially uh, particularly around communications and the availability of uh, news of information of uh, you know ever increasing degrees of complexity. Yeah. How do you strip through all of that and, and get to make a decision? Because it, um, the, the, there becomes another layer of, of worry around procrastination. And the mm. procrastination becomes a, a, like this endless loop where mm. you, you're assessing one strategy, you're thinking about option A, B, C, and D, and at some point you've got to pick something. I'm going to give you two examples of, of, of that that have been very real and forced upon us. All right. So I'm going to go back to uh, two, uh, 2020 to 2020. Um, we've, uh, we've, we're coming out of 2019 uh, with optimism. Uh, the roaring 20s was being branded around and we were, we're, we're, we're leaving the European Union in December 2019. Uh, and, and everything looks stable and, and, and fantastic. And then we are coming into 2020 uh, and, 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 and this is really important to understand, right? So we're, 
I predicted house prices jumping in 2020, 2021, and 2022. And there was a reason for that. And we have to apply logic to anything. So I'll give you the reason in a minute, which I'll make sure I, I come back to, of the reason why I thought we was going to get a boom. But what interrupted that was in January 2020, I saw newsreel about a uh, virus in, in Wuhan. And the World Health Authority had issued a concern right, that this could get out and, and cause a global pandemic. And everyone thought, oh, here we go, here we go, let's take notice. And I paid attention to it and I thought, okay, so I'll look into the, uh, the I'll do a bit of research. And this is where you, the world has changed, right? I can go and get a blog today or I can go and get a YouTube channel and I can spout off whatever I want. And unless I'm, uh, it's hate speech or it's, um, it's a conspiracy theory against the government, it will stay up there. All right. And it'd be my opinion. And I could have no basis for that opinion whatsoever. So I hear people talk about, well, I saw it on Facebook. Okay. So who said it? Who, 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 who said what you said? Yeah. Well, I saw it on the internet. Okay. So where did you see it? And this comes to my point is that when I started uh, to be concerned about uh, coronavirus, I did a search on uh, three things, right? One was uh, virology and, and viruses. And uh, I looked back at Spanish flu, did the research and looked at sites where they were credible. And now this is really important. If you're worrying about shit and you need to get information, you need to do research. So you're now concerned because you've taken the worry out of it. So I'm concerned about it. I need to go and get some information. Sure the information you'll get is credible. And the way you do that is just because you see it on the internet doesn't mean to say it's right. So you need to look a bit further. So I got my information from the Harvard Medical website. Now, Harvard, do we trust Harvard? Would you trust? By and large, by and large yes. By and large, yes. Right? A, 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 academically, it would be yes. well regarded. It's well regarded. So any information that's coming out of Harvard would be a trustworthy place to go and look for your information. So I was getting my information from the Harvard website about virology. I was getting my information about the Spanish flu from, from past records, right? You know, actual numbers, because there was actually a lot of uncertainty around the numbers during that time and what happened to Spanish, Spanish flu. But what was more important is what was going on in the world and how they dealt with it. So they were doing um, social distancing but they didn't have any vaccinations. So my next um, uh, search was vaccinations because how many people were, were, were worried right, about how can, you, how can you produce a vaccine so quickly? It takes years, doesn't it, to get a vaccine? Normally, well, normally you haven't got the world that works together and chucked everything, and the, uh, including the kitchen sink, at trying to get the answer. And every single pharmaceutical company had open source. So whereas normally they'd protect it because they'd want to protect their rights on their product, the, everyone had access to all the information. So they could all, and also we cracked the code for DNA. So we got that information quite quickly. So we, we could... So again, it's getting information in the correct manner. So in 2020, I was concerned this virus could cause us a problem. It then hit Italy in the end of Jan, early Feb, and we saw literally queues of people lining up in hospital corridors on stretchers, on beds, no ventilation equipment. So you could then predict what was going to happen. So if France, Austria... Italy were being hit, Spain was being hit before us. Well, they're going to nick all the PPE equipment, aren't they? <laughs> they're we're going to, they're going to, our government's going to rush in to start producing PPE. And they, so we could see what was happening in Italy. We could see what's happening in France. We could, no one was paying any attention what the governments were doing. They were complaining, you know, showing pictures of, oh my word, so many are dead, so many have called it. But I wanted to know what the French were doing about 
shutting their economy down and how they were getting money to people and how the Italians were doing it and how the Spanish were doing it, because that would give us an indication what our government was going to do. We could then start predicting that if they were going to lock our economies down or lock, you know, put us into lockdown, they were going to have to throw money at the problem. So we could then predict that we're going to get locked down because it's already hit our shores by end of February. So we knew it was, and, and again, we was looking at the numbers, the R rate. You remember the R rate? They got mm -hmm. it down to mm -hmm. below one. Well, the R rate to How start quickly with quickly it, it spread, yeah. It was eight originally, right? And they got it down to one, right? Which is still bad, but, you know, it's not going to be as bad as eight, right? And we could, we could see that this was going to be affecting us. And I'd already worked out, okay, so what do we need to do? This, is, this, this could cause a recession, because if everyone contracts, if everyone was going to do... And I thought, well, actually, the government go throw money at this problem. Let's watch out this plays out. I'm not going to buy any houses in the interim period. The two I've got in auction, I'm just going to let go. I don't care if I lose a few quid on them, because I don't really want to hold them right this moment. So there was two in the auction, and I think we lost 15 grand on a pair of them. I wasn't bothered about that, because I didn't want to be holding anything at that moment in time. Agreed. I went back and said, look, I'm not going to buy it, but if you want to give it, uh, if, if you do want me to buy it today, I will buy it, but it's going to be 20% lower than what I was paying. So I was preparing for the worst. And when you prepare for the worst, then anything other than the worst is a good result. And I always look at things and think, can, can we live with this? Can we, what, what can we live with? How can, What's it going to be? What's the downside for me? And can I live with that downside? Can I accept that? And once you accept the scenario that this is going to be uncertain for a while, we realized once we got shut down, they started throwing money at the economy. They started throwing money at business and they started making sure that people are functioning. Yes, they got it wrong sometimes, but the, overall they got it right. They got that vaccination program. We were the, one of the best countries to come out of lockdown. Everyone slags off. Our, our our government but our government apart from israel were the first out of lockdown the first ones to vaccinate all our population we were the first ones out of the blocks you got you know the work rest of the world was looking in watching us anyway so i wanted to find out what was going to happen with auctions and we saw this whole new transformation of going online so i i avoided that first auction deliberately to see what happened and so I was planning ahead, getting information from the correct places to see what was going to go on. I was looking at that auction. And then I had different, um, as a trader, I've got different data points now. People couldn't view houses, but they were, what, they were watching the video on YouTube. How mm -hmm. many people viewed the, the YouTube video was giving me an indication of how many people might turn up to view the house. So was, there was a mm -hmm. lot of views on one of our houses. How mm. many people had downloaded the legal packs? Now, in the old days, you could turn up in an auction, you registered to bid, but you didn't have had that information prior to the auction coming. So I could now go to the auction and say, how many people have registered to bid for our lot? 20. Oh, okay. We wouldn't know that in a normal auction. If the auction room was packed, we'd probably have a good day. If it was really quiet, you'd have a bad day. Now you had different data points. So it gave me more information and more detailed information. So it's not, it's, it's very similar to, um, you'd see Facebook adverts, right? And everyone slags off Facebook for selling your data. But if you do a, a campaign on Facebook, you can, you can literally state, I want men of a certain age, of a certain um, uh, demographic. You can pinpoint the area, so, yeah. right? So you could, so if you've got a, an audience that that small, you'd pay more for the advertising because you've got a bigger focus, or uh, sorry, a, a more focused um, segment uh, uh, to sell to. So I knew then my data points were actually more favorable to me now because we're digitalized mm -hmm. and we could see how many people were watching the, 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 um, the auction and we could tell, I, of course, I could see which person was bidding, you know, you'd have an, an initial next to it, how many times they'd bid. So it was a whole new ball game, but I had no need to worry about it. I was just concerned. 
So do you see how we can turn a, a, a complete nightmare into a situation where there was, and this is what we did, right? Once we realized what was going to go on, we filled our boots. We bought loads of properties without seeing them. We were just going, yes, we'll have it. We'll make an offer of that. Yes, we'll have it. Yes, we'll have it. When everyone else was sitting on the fence, I was buying. And we were buying some absolute crackers. And they went to auction over the next six months, nine months. It took us a while to buy them because everything was suppressed. Everyone was working from home. It was difficult to get searches. It was more difficult to purchase. But once we come out the other side and the stamp duty changes, we had a market to sell into. And here's the thing I was going to mention earlier. I knew that the market was going to go um, ballistic in 2020, regardless of, of, of the pandemic or not. And the reason I knew that is what happened prior to the pandemic what, that affected property. So bricks that would commonly be... A referendum, be, a referendum yeah. in 2016 affected what people were doing. So they sat on the fence. So the numbers for transactions dramatically reduced between 2016 and 2019. And people put their, 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 their purchasing um, plans on hold. Plans. And, and so once they've gone, we, we knew what was doing and we knew this was done and everyone went, oh, goodness for that. We knew there was going to be a mini boom of people coming in who had been sitting on the fence for the last three years and they were going to be buying houses. And that coincided with stamp duty being changed, the pandemic not being as bad as what people thought it was going to be as far as the economy is concerned. And then this deluge of buyers that came out of the woodwork to buy houses. So we armed with the right information. It could have been deemed as Oh my God, this is, I'm so worried about it. So actually, well, I'm a bit concerned, but let's look at the information first, then build a picture and then act upon it. And then it, it act, we, and then we take advantage of that. And, and so that, uh, I'm saying the, the situation turns worry into an opportunity, really. Completely, absolutely. And we did the same thing in 2008. And I'll give you an example of 2008. In the early 2008, I bought a house in Gilliam in a, a road called Gilliam Road. And the house cost us a hundred Ingram Road, sorry, not Gilliam Road, Ingram Road, Gilliam. And the house cost us a hundred thousand pounds and it was a banger. It's typical what we buy, absolute uh, horrible, stinky, smelly one. And it was we was selling it into the market when interest rates had just chipped up to 5.75 percent. And the banks were going into a bit of a turmoil in September 2008. And we were selling it into that market and we didn't get great money for it. It made 115 grand. So profit to us was minimal really after all our costs. I think we made about six grand, seven grand on it. And I thought, wow, that, that, I was expecting that to sell for 125, 130, but there was a lot of uncertainty. And then all of a sudden, all hell let, let loose. The markets crashed, the stock markets crashed. Uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt that year. Uh, the, and then you had the credit crunch, right? So we was in a situation where, again, we haven't got a clue what's going to go on. All I did know was if people can't buy houses, they can't borrow money, they can't buy houses, we've got to be very, very careful. And I was watching a, 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 a YouTube video by a guy called Warren Buffett. And he turned around and said, be fearful when people are greedy and be greedy when people are fearful. And when the market starts wobbling, buy at 40% below perceived value. He didn't say 40% below the value, perceived value. So if someone perceives the value, so that house I bought in, in Ingram Road was 100 grand, the perceived value is 115,000, well, because it had sold at that, right? They buy 40% below it. 40% is a lot, <laughs> That's a lot. But when there's no money around, that's an opportunity. But you've got to get your timing right. Because if you buy them all at the wrong time, you've paid money for them and you want to keep them or you're trying to fund them, it's going to be very difficult to fund them. But what did happen during that period? And we saw it happen uh, right in front of our eyes. The governments of the world stepped in the Bank of England stepped into this country and produced 
375 billion pounds worth of quantitative easing. And they pumped that money into the system. The governments backed the banks and bought out certain banks, privatized them and, and, and bought them into the fold. So they didn't fail. They didn't want any banks to fail, apart from Lehman Brothers. No banks failed. They got swallowed up by other banks. They got passed off. No, there was, people were panicking and thinking, look what happened to Northern Rock. They were taking their money out of Northern Rock because they thought Northern Rock was going to fail. Northern Rock wasn't the problem. Northern Rock's um, business model was flawed because it was going, it was selling its mortgage book and then going back to, to the money markets to, to, to borrow more money. But no one was buying the books and no one was lending the money. So the, so the bank had no money and everyone was drawing the money out at the same time. Well, if you'd ever run on a bank, you're gonna, it's going to be insolvent by the end of the day if everyone's taking their money out. And that's what happened to Northern Rock. It, what, they weren't the problem. It was the wider banking system that was the problem. It happened in America, not here. That's where the problems were. And it was too big to fail. There were the AIG insurance company had, had, had literally covered so many bets on so many um, CDOs and all these flash names for different uh, derivatives. derivatives. <laughs> the, the, they were going to fail. So they, every country and every central bank <laughs> stepped in bowed them all out and what did they do following um march they dropped the interest rate to half percent unprecedented now what's that's given me that's given me confidence to think well guess what people are going to start doing now that now the banks are being um funded by the bank of england the bank of england did a, a scheme called the funding for lending scheme they could lend money to banks of preferable rate as long as they lend it out well that was going to cause that was going to cause asset prices to rise. We could we could predict that. And we'd gone out and filled our boots. And the point I was trying to make is we bought a house in Ingram Road in 2008 for 100,000. Six months later, or nearly, nearly a year later, I bought a house in Skinner Street, exactly the same layout, for 60 grand and sold it for 87. So I just readjusted all my prices Filled our boots. We had one of the best financial times we'd ever had because if you had to get guess, what would it be worth today? Doesn't matter, does it? Does it matter? Well, if you'd held on to it, it might matter. But uh... why, 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 why do I need to concern myself about that? I had the money out of it there and then. Got the money and 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 yes, it might be worth. But and, and this is a, a this is a, a fascinating uh, other area where where people often um, worry about what other people are doing, and uh, in general, like the grass is always greener. Uh, you know, and and in property, people tend to uh, look at other Here's people's cash flow, yeah, yeah. Or, or or they look at their their profits that they take out on the way through. You've just you've just hit ideally the head ideally head. You, you you have your own strategy and your own plan and you, you stick to that. But here's it, 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 are you hit the nail on the head there when you went to me? So what's it worth today? If you'd have kept it, and what was my response? Who cares? Who cares? Because that's not my strategy. I'm not looking, mm -hmm. oh, the grass is green over there. Well, I wished I'd kept it. If I'd kept every single house I'd purchased, <laughs> wow, wow. Be a different ball game. But I, I didn't. I don't worry about that because there's no point in even thinking about it because it's not my bag. It's not my strategy. It's not my, I, I just think of the aggravation of holding the damn thing. And that's the difference between you and I. So I don't worry yeah. about it. So it's, it's easy to look at other people and compare yourself and think, well, they're doing that. Perhaps I should be doing that. Or perhaps I should. Well, and I see people changing strategies. I've got one strategy. It's very successful. And I stick to it. I'm happy with it. One day, I'll be taking all the money and going, okay, I'm going to dump it into a block of flats, build a block of flats or, or buy a block no funding, go to the council, here's the keys, rent them out to whoever you care, I don't care, just give me, a, uh, uh, send me the money each month and I'll be done. But until that time, I'm not worried about it. Does that make sense? Because it it's, makes perfect sense. It's, it's not worrying about that someone else is doing better than me. I've got, I, I mix around with some extremely wealthy people, extremely wealthy. We're not talking about, you know, a couple of million, we're talking 
hundreds of millions of pounds. These guys I know, but you know, I, it, you know, they do different to what I do. I don't sit there and think, oh, I should have done that. I should have done that. I wish I'd have done that. Or, oh, worry about I should have done this. No, I am where I am, and that's the end of it. And that's I live with that because my choices were very simple. Life is short, very short. You don't know when your time is up. I know that from my own mother. She passed at 23, for goodness sake, right? That reference point has led me to enjoy myself now. And that's what I do. So I don't worry about things unnecessarily. I don't do that because that is a complete waste of my headspace. Worrying about something that might not happen. But there's another one. I think we mentioned this earlier as well. <laughs> worrying about what people might think. That's a, a big one for people. They're afraid of what people might think. Now, we, we did that uh, resilience with you. I was quite open about a lot of things in my life. And someone said to me, yeah, but people might thought oh, so. What, what difference does it make to me? And this is the key. I'm going to tell you this, right? If I bought you a gift, Will, I bought you a gift, right? It's a really nice gift. Here it is. And you say to me, no, Paul, I don't want that gift. And you give it back to me. Who does that gift belong to? So belongs to you now, but thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, thank I, you I, I appreciate it. Yeah, the, the <laughs> thought was in the right yeah. place, mate. Much, much appreciated. <laughs> but so it belongs to me. So if I give you my opinion, mm -hmm. Will, I think you're an absolute tosser. And you go... I'll, 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 hand, I'll hand that back to you, uh, Paul. Yeah. Uh, if you <laughs> say to me, what do you mean? You own it. You own it. You've just yeah. owned it. So if you say to me, as you said just now, I hand it back to you. I don't, I don't want your opinion. Thanks very much. You can keep it. Who does that belong mm -hmm. to? Me. And that's what I'm like with other people's opinions. If they think I'm a dickhead, that's their opinion, right? And mm -hmm. they've got the right to that opinion. And they mm -hmm. could have all sorts of reasons why they think I'm a dickhead. But that's their problem, not mine. It's, it's got nothing to do with me. What they think is irrelevant. Because I believe that... I remember the first time I ever got a negative review on my book. And it was quite a scathing negative review. It was really, you know, quite nasty. And I thought, well, that's their opinion. It was a woman who wrote, uh, that's her opinion. But the next one was a raving review. Well, hang on a second. These two people have seen something completely different. So that balances itself out because... Does it matter if it's a good one or a bad one? It's irrelevant. It's just someone's opinion. That's all it is. And they can't hurt you. People's opinions can't hurt you. Cannot hurt you at all. Well, one, of the, one of the things I've observed about you, Paul, is you're, um, you're a great man for the cycling. Um, what, what do you get out of it apart from the, the physical benefits? C cycling? Yeah. Riding my bike. And not not just the riding, like like you you take it very seriously. Your preparation, your um, what what you do with the the machine in advance and afterwards, and um, you you seem to have a uh, like a very structured way of approaching the whole thing. Yeah, I think I think that comes from the way I felt as a child. Um, growing up, I had asthma, couldn't run fifty yards. My mum died of asthma as well. So it was, it was something that I was aware of. Um, I was the kid, and uh, you're quite a sportsman, right? Um, but I was the kid, if you was the team captain, you'd be thinking, I don't want ribbons on our team. I'd rather play without him than with him. He's that bad, right? Oh, dear. Right? Oh, dear. So, so I didn't get picked for anything. Right? I was actually that kid, but I, I, I worked hard on, on not being that kid. Well, here's the thing. I worked hard in my adult life not to feel the way that kid felt because mm -hmm. I felt uh, weak. I felt um, feeble. And I made a decision probably in my mid-20s to go to the gym before I went to work every morning. So when I became an agent, 
because uh, in the baking trade, I was fairly, it was fairly physical. So I was quite reasonably fit in them days. Still had asthma. I still got asthma today. But I trained, I trained myself. I trained myself to say, okay, so I'm going to push through that asthma. I'll try, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that it doesn't, make sure I've got my inhaler with me just in case. It doesn't affect me like it, it used to. Uh, but I control it, if that makes sense. But so I, I, I do it because I don't want to feel that way like I did as a child. So in my head, it's like, well, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something well. It's, that's another thing that I think about is if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it properly. What's the point in doing it half-heartedly? Um, I'm a great believer in... Um, uh, we had a, a, a trip to the Alps in the uh, in in the summer. I think you've interviewed Jilly Barlow. It's her 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 chalet she lent it to me, and we were riding around them mountains. You know, <laughs> we're talking some serious cycling there, serious bike riding. And I wanted to make sure I didn't suffer going up there. I didn't want to suffer, so I prepared for it. I worked hard. I trained hard. Because what's the point in suffering? You know, it's going to be hard enough as it is, right? Riding up a mountain, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it's, it, and, and then it's what it says about me as a person. The preparation that I put in, the hard work. I'm not a competitor. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to compete with you. I'm not going to, I'm not a team sport person, uh, but I'm going to compete with myself. And that's what I think about is that I want to be better than yesterday. Well, uh, inspirational stuff. Uh, Paul Ribbons, the Resilience Series continues. Uh, I'd encourage people to look back at the back episodes or, or to check Paul out on either YouTube or uh, get in touch with him at paul at paulribbons.com. Um, I'm Will Mallow. This is My Property World. Thanks again, Paul. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed.